You're listening to a series on the historicity of Jesus' resurrection. Most of the information in this series is drawn from Dr. Dale Allison's The Resurrection of Jesus, Apologetics, Polemics, History. You can find links to other episodes in this series, as well as his fantastic book, in the description. Last episode, we explored five goals of this historical Jesus series. The first is to show that to emulate Christ, we must know who he is. To know who he is, we need to know about his historical person, as well as how his disciples perceived him. Essentially, a good Christology demands reflection on the historical Jesus. My second goal is to show that the Gospel writers were not primarily historians. They were theologians who, guided by the Holy Spirit, sought to build the church by writing down collections of traditions. This explains the disharmonies and contradictions in the Gospels. Third is that we as Catholics can and should incorporate non-Catholics into our studies. The author of this book, Dr. Allison, is Presbyterian. Fourth is we'd like to address both flawed opponents of the resurrection narratives, as well as overly optimistic Christians who think we have a slam dunk case for proving the resurrection. We do not. While these first four points will be covered throughout the series, I'm dedicating the next couple episodes to exploring why the Catholic Church has distanced herself from historical Jesus studies, and what the current state of historical Jesus studies are today. This isn't detailed in Dr. Allison's book as much. I'll actually be drawing from Anglican scholar N.T. Wright's book, Jesus and the Victory of God. Another phenomenal read. It's generally accepted that the historical Jesus movement had three stages or quests. The Old Quest, the New Quest, and the Third Quest. Wright traces back the origins of the Old Quest to the Protestant Reformation. The Protestants, as many of you may know, heavily criticized the Catholics for relying on what they perceived as irrelevant traditions that had nothing to do with Scripture. This inevitably led scholars to parsing out Jesus' commandments from those that the Church gradually created. This is, of course, radically different than how the Catholic Church perceives the relationship between Jesus and the Church. To Catholics, Jesus gave us not a list of rules and not even a book, but a community to preserve and safeguard his message. You can check out my series on magisterial teaching authority in the Catholic Church, link in the description. To many Protestants of the Reformation, the Church muddled Jesus' message. To Catholics, the Church preserved and matured his message. Bear in mind this is a great oversimplification, but the point is that the idea that the historical Jesus and his church could be separated opened the door to some very interesting ideas, especially during the Enlightenment. You see, the Enlightenment philosophers and historians believed that everything, including miracles, was explainable by science. To many of them, the separation between Jesus and the church evolved into a separation between the Jesus of history and the Jesus of myth. To opponents of Christianity, this meant we could explain all of Jesus' miracles by basically saying that the disciples, well, made them up. Many scholars like Herman Ramirez, who wrote during the mid-1700s, were deists, meaning they believed God existed in the principles of science and nature, but not as a personal, loving, intervening being. To Ramirez, Jesus was just a failed Jewish reformer, a political revolutionary of sorts. In response to Ramirez, we see some Protestant theologians who accepted the historical mythical divide, but insisted that Jesus was indeed a religious reformer, not a political revolutionary. Thus, a divide in historical Jesus studies was formed. One camp said Jesus' followers preserved his message and can be trusted. The other said Jesus' followers distorted his message and could not be trusted. Neither of these sides really involved Catholics, who throughout the 19th and 20th centuries distanced themselves from historical Jesus studies. As academia shifted from the Enlightenment, which focused on the hard sciences, to things like idealism and eventually existentialism, which focused on history and self-reflection, so did the focus of historical Jesus studies. You see this in the writings of people like Rudolf Bultmann, who rejected Jesus as an apocalyptic prophet. To Bultmann, Jesus was an existentialist of sorts, well ahead of his time, who warned people not of a historical apocalypse, but apocalypses in our own souls. This was the new quest for the historical Jesus. By the mid-20th century, we end up with a historical Jesus who was a wise man, fashioned like the Greek philosophers. 
whose ideas were appropriated by Jews and structured into a religion. On the defense, Protestant scholars were eager to point out the many unique things that Christians could not have invented by themselves, and thus must have been from the historical Jesus. Notice how neither side seemed eager to explore Jesus' connection to his Jewish roots. So what were Catholics doing while this was all happening? Well, popes discouraged Catholics from getting involved in historical Jesus studies. In fact, there were dozens of decrees throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries forbidding Catholics from studying the Bible outside of church-sanctioned activities. Now here's the thing, as harsh as that sounds, I don't blame the popes. By this point, from a Catholic perspective, scholars had to shred Jesus apart. They severed his teachings from his churches, they divided him and his teachings into historical and mythical categories, they severed Jesus from his Jewish roots, though one could argue Catholics did that too. Point being, the mission to either disprove or vindicate Christianity through scientific and historical tools only seemed to threaten the Church's intimate relationship with the Word of God. Since the Vatican Council, though, the Church has relaxed her grip on biblical studies, allowing greater freedom for lay Catholics like me to participate in Bible studies and interfaith events. Now is not the time and place to detail how this all happened. My point is that the Church's relationship with historical Jesus studies was hostile for centuries. By the time the Second Vatican Council formally relaxed things, the Church had a lot of catching up to do. So where were the historical Jesus studies at the end of Vatican II? Let's talk about the Jesus Seminar. At this conference, beginning in 1985, historical Jesus scholars from all around North America gathered to vote on which passages from the Gospels were historical and which were not. They not only included the synoptic Gospels in their survey, but also apocryphal ones, meaning not canonically accepted by the Church, like the Gospel of Thomas. The result of their sessions, which were held every few years, was a New Testament color-coded by the likelihood of the historicity of events. Interestingly enough, from what I've heard, each iteration of this Bible has a greater percentage of mythical stories rather than historical ones as time has passed. The Jesus Seminar has been lauded in many academic circles as the quintessential historical Jesus project. There are several problems with it, though. First, it recruited scholars who were affiliated with logical positivism, a school of thought that believes everything can be known through empirical scientific means that there is such thing as an unbiased, objective, scientific perspective. It emphasizes the opposition of fact and fantasy, history and fiction, science and superstition, etc. It has been criticized for being too optimistic, even arrogant, in its assertion that everything can be known via empirical scientific methods. And while the Jesus Seminar did not outright state it was a logical positivist project, the scholars who built it and advertised it certainly seem to have that slant. The second problem is that many things that the seminar reduces to a binary vote are far too complex to do that to. For example, questions like oral tradition is fluid, yes or no, and only a small portion of the sayings attributed to Jesus in the Gospels were actually spoken by him, yes or no, are vague, subjective, and very complicated. Finally, the Jesus Seminar ends up with a remarkably modern, politically correct Jesus who only operates according to the modern laws of physics. Basically, they just so happened to have recruited scholars united in logical positivism and ended up with the Jesus who shared their same opinions and operated according to their understanding of how the world works. And that's the thing about the new quest for the historical Jesus. It seems like every scholar's historical Jesus turns out to reflect their own biases and viewpoints. Burton Max Jesus never condemned anyone. It's the early Christians who turned a wise, tolerant man into a contemptuous judge. John Dominic Crossan's Jesus is a wise man who sought to overhaul social order. He was a social justice warrior, a radical egalitarian. There are scholars who twisted Jesus into being a proto-existentialist who just so happens to agree with everything Martin Heidegger ever said. Others turned Jesus into a cynic philosopher. Marcus Borg's Jesus was a religious ecstatic who healed people and stood against oppression, but he never claimed to die for anyone's sins. He just fought for mercy and inclusion in society. So I've already stated this, but guys, where is Jesus' Jewishness? Why wasn't anyone talking about it? 
As I mentioned, one school of thought considered Jesus a more secular teacher whose ideas were appropriated by religious fanatics, and another school of thought considered Jesus a rebel against Judaism whose ideas directly led to the creation of a new religion. This is where the third quest comes in. The third quest, which began towards the end of the 20th century, began engaging early non-Christian sources on a way not really seen before. And it also involved Catholics, such as Father John Meyer, who we will talk about next episode. This quest also took a more nuanced view of how diverse first century Judaism really was. There were dozens of Jewish sects competing against each other during Jesus' lifetime, and to classify Jesus as non-Jewish does a disservice to this fact. The third quest also tries understanding how Jesus' message would have been understood in his own time period, not ours. Then it sets the crucifixion as the cornerstone through which the historical Jesus is to be understood. Essentially, what was it about Jesus that led to his violent execution? Finally, and perhaps most importantly, Third Quest historical Jesus scholars see Jesus not as a wise man or a founder of a new religion, but as a Jewish, and I mean Jewish, reformer who saw himself as radically in line with the prophets and books of the Old Testament. Thus, the third quest, which still goes on today, asks five key questions. How Jewish was Jesus? What did Jesus want to do to Judaism? Why did Jesus die? How and why did the early church begin? And how and why did we end up with four Gospels? Next episode, we'll explore how modern historical Jesus scholars, such as Dr. Dale Allison, are trying to answer these questions. Until next time, God bless you.